Good morning, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us today. Hey, it's November already. Can you believe it? The fall, fall is in full force. Um, leaves are coming down. Um, our family spent the day yesterday out in the backyard getting it cleaned up and ready for the next season. The trampoline sides came down. And, you know, we're just getting ready for the next season. And I've seen some of you even, Rehan, um, on social media have been putting up Christmas decorations already. Um, you know, it's just maybe we just can't wait to celebrate Christmas this year to ha finally have like a celebration that we can look forward to. <coughs> Excuse me. You know, for years um, living here in Germany, Christmas was actually kind of a difficult time of year for me. Um, it was just so different the way Christmas was celebrated here as it was to the way I knew it and the way I enjoyed it. And one of those things was Christmas stockings. Now, this may seem like a little thing, but it was important to me. And having a cross-cultural marriage, it was something that my husband just didn't understand. You see, he didn't know anything about Christmas stockings. It wasn't something that was ever part of his tr tradition, and why would you need to do them anyway? Uh, so, you know, it was one of those things that, you know, I would say, yeah, Christmas stockings, and my mom even knit him a stocking because it was such an important part of our family's traditions. But he just didn't get what was supposed to go in the stockings. And, you know, one of the first years, he put a cheese knife in my stocking, which, you know, it could be appropriate. It could be a good gift, but it wasn't it just didn't make sense to me. Like, why would you put a cheese knife in my stocking? Like, I was expecting tea and, um, I don't know, a pair of socks and uh, some candles. These are the types of things, maybe some chapstick. These are the types of things that, for me, always belong in the Christmas stocking. But he was just like, what do you need that for? You have enough chapstick in your drawer. Why do you need another one? So, you know, this was kind of a, an issue over the years. And at some point, like a few years, especially when the kids were little and I was like filling all their stockings, I just bought my own stuff for my stocking. It's like, hey, why put the pressure on him of needing to do this? It's not his tradition. It's important to me. L I shouldn't put that expectation on him. I'll just take care of it. So then came one year. It was mid-December and I'm like do trying to get all the Christmas shopping done. And I asked him, you know, let me just be open about this. Should I just go ahead and fill my own Christmas stocking? And that year he said, no, I have a plan. I'm going to do it. Okay. Now I'm like, very like, what is, like, I don't know. What should I expect? I'm like, he has a plan. He wants to do it himself. Should I get my hopes up? Guys, let me tell you, that year he nailed it. It was perfect. Every gift in the stocking was on point. It was things that I had never said, like wish list, this is what I want, but that he had listened to me and he knew this is going to make Laura happy. And I felt so loved, not because this was like, you know, we had been married already many years. We had been through all kinds of ups and downs. But in that moment, I felt so loved because he had listened to me and he had shown that he was listening and showed that in the gifts that he put in my stocking. So this today, this morning, we're talking about loving each other well. We're continuing in the Emotionally Healthy Church series. And as you may have figured out already, this each principle tends to build on the ones before it. And that's no different this week. We started out with looking beneath the surface. If we look beneath the surface of our own lives, what's really going on? We were able to then see what was see the things that are going on that make us act and react the way we do and look at our past and break the power that the past has over us. We learned to live in brokenness and vulnerability. We know that we have all have stuff. We all have stuff that we're working on and working through. And we can live in that and we can be honest about it. We receive the gift of limits, knowing that as much as we want to be like whatever standard, we have limits and we don't always make it. And other people have limits and that's okay and that's good too. We receive that. We accept it. And then we embrace grieving and loss. We talked about last week. We mourn because things in this world are not the way they're supposed to be. And that's how it is. And we mourn that. And that's a good process to go through. 
You know, and all of these are very internal processes. They're things that I'm looking within myself and processing things within myself. And of course, this is best, best worked out in the context of community. And that's where our, commu our connect groups have been so important as another point, another time during the week to dig deeper into these things that we've been talking about, to share them with each other and to pray for each other, to work through them together. But now the focus today is also on kind of looking outside of ourselves. How do we take all of this that we've been working on, that we've been learning, and apply it to loving each other well? You know, in the gospel, when Jesus is asked, what is most important? What are the most important commands? He says, love God and love other people as you love yourself. How do we love well? That brings the question, how do we love each other well? And the name of this principle is make incarnation your model for loving well. So if we want to learn how to love each other well, our best source is to look to Jesus. What did he do? How did he love us? And probably the biggest or the most profound way that he showed his love for us was the incarnation. God wanted to demonstrate how much he loved hum us as humanity. And so he sent his son. In Galatians 4.4 4, it says, But when the time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law. And in 1 John 4, 9, it says, this is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world. God wanted to reveal more of himself to humanity. He had revealed himself already through the law, but he wanted to reveal even more of himself, his character, who he is, what his kingdom is like. And in order to do that, he sent his son, Jesus. This is a real mystery of incarnation because Jesus was born human, as a human, with all of the limitations that that brings, but at the same time, he remained fully God. You know, I don't know of many other faith traditions that include something this fantastic and this remarkable. You know, they have people who have received a revelation from God, and maybe they have gods who descend, but a God who takes on who remains God and takes on the limitations of humanity, who willingly submits himself to his creation. J.I. Packer, in his book, Knowing God, has a whole chapter on this. It's called God Incarnate. And he says, he's talking about the difficulties that people have with believing and understanding the gospel. And he gets to the incarnation and he says, in fact, the real difficulty, because the supreme this is the supreme mystery with which the gospel confronts us. The really staggering Christian claim is that Jesus of Nazareth was God made man. The second person of the Godhead become the second man. And that's a reference to first uh, passage in First Corinthians. But going back to this, determining human destiny, that he took humanity without loss of deity so that Jesus of Nazareth was as truly and fully divine as he was human. Nothing in fiction is so fantastic as this truth of the incarnation. For God, it wasn't enough to look down on his creation, to say, I love you guys, like from way back. He looked down. He said it was good. And then he, he came close. He came to us. He became one of us. Part of the reason that he did that was that so that he could fully relate and understand. In Hebrews 4, um, it talks a lot about this mystery of incarnation as well and the reason that Jesus, as our high priest, came and submitted himself to the will of the Father and to being human. And it says, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. Let us approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. So this was how Jesus, how God the Father, 
felt it so important to show their love, to send Jesus, that Jesus became one of us. What does that mean for us? How do we live that out, this incarnation? How do we live out a w incarnate, uh, incarnate life with each other? How do we truly enter into another person's experience? So in the Missionary Healthy Church, Peter Cesaro, he writes about a skill called reflective listening. And he presents this as a way that we can enter into each other's experiences. He says, the person listening attempts to enter into the world of the person speaking, laying aside questions, agendas, defenses, and simply seeks to understand the other person's experience. The person speaking has the floor and they speak, and the other person is just listening. How often when we listen to each other, are you formulating already, what is my response gonna be? What do I think about that? What, does that, what issues do that bring up in me? Even we start to think of our own experiences that relate to that person's. That's good to a certain extent, but reflective listening calls us to fully concentrate on the other person, to make it about them and what they're saying. Peter also says that this is much easier said than done. He's, tr he's right about that, isn't he? How can we do that though? How can we learn it? Can we learn it? Can we just practice this art of listening and just trying to hear from the other person what they are saying? I wanna share with you a story about a summer that changed my life. It was the summer way back, <laughs> um, before my final year, year of university. I, so the summer I turned 21 years old, and I wanted clarity on what I should do with my life after I finished university. And so I signed up for an internship through a Christian organization that would place me working at a summer camp, so working with and teaching kids, and doing ministry in the city. And I thought, this is perfect, because these were the two options I was most strongly considering for after I finished university. I'm either going to teach or I wanted to do ministry. And I was hoping that through doing this, I would gain some clarity. I had, so I spent the summer in the inner city of Boston. I moved literally like 20 minutes from where I lived to go to university. I did a lot of listening and watching. I had grown up in a multicultural context and in fact, found myself as a white US born person, often in the minority in my friends groups. And although I related well to everyone and got along with everyone, there were just things I didn't understand and things I had never seen. So that summer, as I listened, I started to see and understand things differently. I saw our history books and the curriculum offered in schools with different eyes. And I started to learn that the history of my country was not always as it was presented to be. I saw firsthand how my black colleagues were treated differently, unjustly, because no other reason than the color of their skin. Now, how did I react to this, to all of these things, all of these inputs? You know, there was a part of me that wanted to react with guilt, like how could I have not seen this? How can this be? With disbelief at their, that this is really happening still today. Denial, it's not really that bad, is it? But as I was challenged to listen and observe, I had to accept things. These are the way things are. I also had to deal with self-righteousness. Well, it's not me. I'm not part of the problem. And, you know, defending myself. But, you know, these responses are all about me. And in that moment, I had to decide to put myself aside and to listen and to learn, to observe to take what the people were sharing, what they were bringing as their own experiences, and just listen and say, yes, I hear you. Tell me more. And as I looked beneath the surface, and in a way went through these processes that we've been talking about up to now, looking beneath the surface, seeing what's really going on, understanding the limits of our system, being angry at injustice and mourning that things are not the way that they're supposed to be. 
you know, part of incarnational ministry is about living where you work and where you do ministry. And Peter also talks about his own journey in that. But living there and being there isn't enough. We need to listen. We need to listen to each other. We come into a new situation, a new relationship, humbly, ready to learn, ready to serve, then we, our hearts are just open. We can do so much. And as I did that that summer, I learned so much, and it changed the plans, the plans I had made for my future. Who do you need to listen to today? Is it a friend, a relationship with someone that you're already in? Someone who is hurting and who's gone through loss recently, and they just need someone to listen. They don't need... Um, you to quote Bible verses to them or tell them about God's goodness or how all things work together. They just need you to listen, to value what they're saying. Guys, this isn't easy. It really is. It's so much easier said than done, especially when you take it to think about what about someone with a different political view than yours? Can you ask them, what do you believe? Why do you believe that? And then just listen to what they have to say. It's not easy. If you are a white person living in Germany, can you ask a black friend, what is it like living in Germany? What has been your experience? Tell me about it. I want to hear. Don't make excuses or look for explanations. Just hear what they have to say. Just listen. And so as we enter into this process of reflective listening, we also need to remember to hold on to ourselves. And this is the second point that Peter brings up in the Emotionally Healthy Church. We listen and we hold on to ourselves. You know, going back to Jesus, Jesus throughout his ministry knew exactly who he was and what he was sent to do. He often refers to himself as the son of man. And that's commonly thought of as a reference to Daniel 7, where it says, In my vision at night I looked, and there before me was one like a son of man, coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the ancient of days and was led into his presence. He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All nations and peoples of every language worshipped him. His dominion was an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, and his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. Think of this. Think of this description every time Jesus calls himself the Son of Man. He knows who he is. He knows that he has all authority, glory, and sovereign power. He knew who he was, and he submitted himself to creation. He also submitted himself to the will of the Father. He said in John 5, very truly I tell you, the Son can do nothing by himself. He can also do only what he sees his Father doing, because whatever the Father does, the Son also does. For the Father loves the Son and shows him all he does. Yes, and he will show him even greater works than these, so that you will be amazed. So he knew his limitations as a human. He knew the limitations of his mission. And he gave himself fully to this humanity. But never so much that he forgot who he was. He didn't neglect who he was or his deity and the relationship to his father. In his humanity, he had to sleep. He cried. He was grieved knowing that he was who he was in relationship to the Father. He stayed in the temple after Passover, even after his family was returning to home. And he would wake early to pray and to seek that relationship with his Father. And I love in John 13, because it kind of sums it up for me. It's one of the stories I just love going back to and seeing how Jesus works this out, these two sides of it. Beginning of John 13, starting in verse 1. It was just before the Passover festival. Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having left his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. 
Jesus knew. And what Jesus knew about himself allowed him to love his disciples well. Continuing on. The evening meal was in progress, and the devil had already prompted Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal, took, out, took off his outer clothing, wrapped a towel around his waist. And after that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with a towel that was wrapped around him. Jesus knew who he was. He knew that he was sent by God the Father for a purpose and that all things were under his power. And so what did he do with that knowledge? He got up and he took the position and role of a servant. And he washed his disciples' dirty, stinky feet. When Jesus put the towel around his waist and pours the water into the basin and washes his disciples' feet, it doesn't change who he is. It doesn't change the fact that all things are under his power. And this is what I would argue, what I would say is true humility. Knowing who you are and loving people and serving them. True humility doesn't say I'm nothing and I'm worthy of nothing. And it doesn't say I'm better than you and so I come to fix and rescue you. It says I know who I am. And I know it so deeply and so fully, I have nothing to prove. It's not about me. Now, going back to my time in the, in the city serving the kids, I didn't have to stop being me. <clears throat> the kids there, they didn't need a me who was sorry about being who I was. They didn't need an overinflated me who came in with this idea that I was going to rescue them from whatever situation they were facing just by being there for one summer. They needed me, the nerdy college student, who was ready to listen to their experiences, and not judge or justify, just listen and value what they said. I was ready to share with them about Jesus, stories about him, and I was ready to share my enthusiasm for learning about science and math. And that was what they needed. Do you know who you are? Do you know where you have come from and where you are going? To love God and love your neighbor as yourself. We often insert in there we need to love ourselves. And I believe what is the key of that, what that's really about, is that we need to know ourselves. And we need to accept that. We need to know who we are. Who does God say you are? And we need to know that this is good. We are good. The way that God has made us in the position, the place you were born, God placed you there for a reason. All the experiences that you've had, they're there for a reason. And they make you who you are. Do you know who you are? In Psalm 139, it says, For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. Do you believe this is true for you? So often I read this verse over my children. What happened when I stopped and said, do I believe that this is true for me? That I am one of God's fearfully and wonderfully made works. Do I know, is my identity rooted in Christ so that I can know who I am and out of knowing I can hold on to that and love other people well? And so here we are. We know who we are and we hang on to that. Jesus entered his world, but he entered our world and remained himself. And as you listen and enter another's world, they're best served when you hang on to yourself. And so that leaves us with the third point of hanging between two worlds. And that's much of what Jesus did all throughout his ministry. Fully himself, fully listening to and engaging the people around him. He can heal. He can perform miracles. And yet he is tempted and he hurts and he cries. 
In John 11, there's the story of Lazarus' death and his resurrection. And I strongly encourage you, I'm not going to read the whole thing right now, but I strongly encourage you to read that chapter. So much in it. But, you know, Jesus is given word that Lazarus is sick, and he stays where he is for two more days, and then says, all right, we need to go there. Now, the disciples know that in order to get where Lazarus is, this is not an easy journey. In fact, it's quite dangerous. And they're like, Jesus, you know, he's probably dead already. There's not much we can do. Um, do we really need to go there and risk our own lives? So they start to protest. And Jesus says to them, I t he told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. And for your sake, I'm glad I was not there so that you may believe. But let us go to him. And Jesus is so matter of fact about here. And he's so clear also. This, what's going on here in this situation is not just about like the actual situation. God has something to reveal about himself in it. When he gets there and he um, speaks with Martha and with Mary, he's so moved and he weeps. He feels deeply. And then he goes to the tomb and he prays, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe you sent me. And so balancing these two worlds, knowing who he is and where he has come from, feeling deeply and being fully human, Jesus moves through his ministry on earth. My last, in my, after my summer in the city, I went back to university, finished my bachelor's degree, and then at the invitation of the woman I had worked for that summer, I moved back to the inner city. It was fun and it was really messy at times. There was conflict and pain, as well as victories and hope. And the woman who invited me into her life at that time, she's still my best friend today. And I continue to draw on the relationships and the experiences of that community and that experience almost daily. There are many moments I will never forget. You know, the opportunity I had sitting with a young boy, he must have been in third or fourth grade, and he was just always acting up, always anywhere but doing his homework. And I finally got him to sit down, and he looked at me and said, I can't do this, I'm stupid. And I was able to sit there and look at him and say, no, you're not stupid. Let me explain this to you in another way. And because of who I was and my love for math, I was able to explain to him, bringing myself, holding on to who I was, and listening to him. And there were moments like the birthday cake that my friend made for me with math equations all over it, which made me feel loved and appreciated because she was valuing who I was and where I had come from. How do you hang in the balance? How do we do that as a community, enter each, uh, each other's worlds, and at the same time, hold on to ourselves? As we get ready to close, let's look at why God chose to show his love in this way through incarnation. Jesus knew where he had come from and where he was going. He knew what the end would be, and that allowed him to endure literally hanging between two worlds and becoming the bridge and the connection between them. In 1 John 4, Verse 9, it goes on after that. I'm going to read through verse 12. It says, This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only Son into the world that we may live through him. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another... God lives in us, and his love is made complete in us. God spared nothing to show his love to us, and we do not have to earn his love, only accept it. But since we know and receive this love, he asks, asks us to share it. He asks us to love each other the way that he has loved us. 1 Corinthians 13 is often called the love chapter because it explains in detail what love looks like. It is not about marriage. 
It is so often quoted at weddings. Maybe that's the, your main association with it. But this chapter is not about marriage. It is Paul writing to the whole church and calling the whole church in all of our interactions to be reflective of this kind of love. Starting at the end of chapter 12, he says, and yet I will show you the most excellent way. If I speak in the tongues of men or angels, but have no love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have faith that can move mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast, but I do not have love, I gain nothing. If I show up every Sunday for church service, and every Wednesday for Connect Group, but I don't love the people around me. What is it worth? What is it about? Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered, and it keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, and always perseveres. What would it look like for us to love each other this way? To be patient, to be kind with each other in, in our words. Not boasting or prideful, but rejoicing with those who rejoice and mourning with those who mourn. Holding each other is accountable and seeking each other's best and also encouraging each other and honoring each other. Forgiving and extending grace where necessary. What does this look like for you in your family or with your housemates, in your connect group or in your team? Maybe there's someone who's a little further away that you need to call or send a text to just to let them know you're there and you're ready to listen. You know, especially in these past months where we've been forced to physically be distant from each other, it, we can feel really disconnected. I wanna encourage you this morning to step beyond that and to reach out and make those connections in whatever ways we can right now. Whether it's a one-on-one, -on -one, two household meeting or it's done virtually, we can still reach out and connect with each other and listen. Imagine how beautiful it would be to be a church living out the example, living out Jesus' requests of us to love each other to create a safe place to experience the love, acceptance, and forgiveness of Jesus Christ. I want to pray together right now. And first of all, I want to pray for this point of knowing who you are. Do you know who you are? Have you done the work that we've been talking about over these last weeks of looking below the, below the surface, of breaking the power of the past, accepting your vulnerability, your limitations. Do you know who you are? Do you know who God says you are? And do you know his deep love for you? In Ephesians 3, it says, I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you being rooted and established in love may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ and to know this love that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Father God, and I pray this right now. I pray for everyone watching and listening. I pray that we would be filled with the knowledge of this deep love that you have for us. I pray that we would be able to look within ourselves, look beneath the surface, to see everything that's going on there, and to know that over it all, you love us, and you have called us, Lord God. And I want you to pray with me right now.
If you don't know that love or if it's been a while since you took a moment to acknowledge it, to bask in it, I want you to pray with me right now. Father God, thank you that you love me. Thank you that I am your child. Thank you that because of your son, Jesus Christ, I can be in relationship with you. And I accept your forgiveness. I accept your love, Jesus. And I want to live in relationship with you. And as we know who we are, let's have courage to love each other and to hang between the worlds. In 1 John 4, it says, Dear friends, since God so loved us, we ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. And so, Father God, we pray this as well this morning. We pray that your love would be made complete in us that we would be a reflection of who you are as we love each other. And even as you prayed and as you instructed that people outside and observing us, they would know that we are your people because of our love for each other. Amen.